Okay, this is a famous Capablanca vs. Tartagoa game, played in 1924. It was featured in um, Chernev's classic book, The Most Instructive Games of Chess Ever Played, and it had the theme of Rook on the Seventh Rank. I think also another couple of themes demonstrated by this game is the power of the passed pawn and also the power of the king in the end game. So it was all these positional elements which led to a very nice, fine looking win. Capoplanca played d4 and Tartakoa played e6. Tartakoa, by the way, is the source of many interesting chess quotations. He also is the author of 500 master games of chess. So he's quite a, an interesting character in his own right. Um, almost as well known as Capoplanca in his, in his own ways. Capablanca played knight f3 and Tartakoa played now f5. So with this move sequence, um, the more dangerous Stoughton Gambit is um, avoided. And Tartakoa is just playing his um, Dutch defence setup. The Dutch defence, in particular the Stonewall, hasn't got a particularly good reputation nowadays because of all the holes uh, it can create on the dark squares. But in this variation, which Tartakoa plays, this is um, like the classical variation where black isn't committing so many of the pawns to, to, to white squares here, but instead um, playing for a rather crude um, attack with queen e8 and d6 later. Um, this fincetto seems quite natural though, and now we have the queen e8. Capablanca though is quite calm in this position, he plays queen e2, perhaps with the idea now of, of e4, which is quite thematic against the Dutch. Knight e4 was played. Uh, Capablanca welcomes the simplifications though, and he doesn't even mind his pawns being doubled. Uh, so his pawns get doubled here, and then he plays a4, possibly with the idea of dissolving this isolated pawn with a5 now. But here, Tartaka perhaps overcommits now, he, he doesn't yet another exchange, so we, we really have plummeted into a simplified position straight out of the opening. So we have a knight versus a bishop here, but this um, isolated pawn um, would seem to be, you know, Nimzovich would seem to be licking his lips here because of this isolated pawn, in theory. But white drums up um, play, and this pawn doesn't seem to be that significant in this game. Other factors become more significant. Tosco targets it now. Now we have Capablanca again playing for this e4 idea, which he now plays. And after this exchange, so black's accepted two pawn islands, and white's now got three pawn islands. Um, there's also this potential now after g6 uh, for white to undermine g6 with a later h4, as we'll see. But first, Capablanca solidifies his position a bit with g3 just in case there's a rook f8 threat. But it also vacates g2 for his king, as we'll see, which he now uses. So the king's vacated, which allows the rook to swing across to h1 now. So we've got this reserve plan now of h4, h5 coming up. But this is interrupted uh, briefly with this d5, which invites further simplification. Black really hasn't... Um, played to blockade this pawn, which perhaps maybe he should have done with, with c5. This um, further simplification means that the real weakness now on white is this potentially backward c pawn, which Tartakova manoeuvres for, uh, with this rook f6 now to play rook c6 to attack that. But Capablanca is still ruthlessly pursuing this, this h uh, pawn undermining, which would also give the rook now a uh, scope for reaching the seventh rank and the king uh, rather unfortunately can't defend h7 easily here so we see that this rook infiltration to the seventh rank has has been allowed which is unfortunate for black because this compensation um, although tangible um, does let Capablanca build on this rook on the seventh as we'll see shortly now first he plays g4 not worrying at the moment about rook c3 because a bishop takes g6. Now, there is um, a potential useful idea of knight e3 check. 
and Capital Bank positively encourages Knightley Free Check now. He lets Black solve an apparent problem of this route apparently being tied to the G6. So this is a very surprising move now from Capablanca, allowing knight e3 check to, and then knight f5, which will protect the g6 pawn and allow black to carry on with this um, gobbling of the c pawn. So we have this curious sequence now where Capablanca has decided that he's going to sacrifice this and he sees more potential for the rook on 7th rather than just this just pressurizing on c7 which is of course protected he plays um, a brilliant move now just king g3 sacking not just this pawn but as we'll see yet another pawn here because he, he's obviously seeing rook f3 so he's now playing g5 to really get this king infiltration going um, so black now is temporarily material up but after this sequence, White's got one of his pawns back. Now he's got a huge pass pawn here. Fantastic king. And the rook on the seventh, stopping black king from coming out. So White's virtually winning here. Black has to play passively now. And just observe as pawns start dropping off. Um, this g7 pawn is now immune. Black can't take because this ending will be totally winning for White. Just taking there and... King c6 and just queen the d pawn doesn't even have to go for the a pawn. So this is now lost for black. This is completely lost ending. King d6, rook c2, d5. Rook c7, a nice bridging move. It's all technique now. Uh, this d pawn is enough. White doesn't even have to worry about this a pawn. And after this, black's had enough and resigns. So there are at least three major themes there, if we quickly rewind to this brilliant pawn sack scenario. Um, so white built on the rook on the seventh here with king g3, just sacking this pawn. So emphasizing his pressure, building on the pressure, building this past pawn, rook on the seventh and this king infiltration. It was an excellent um, end game demonstration really. And noted by Chernev um, in his instructive games book and put as the first game of that fine book the most instructive games of chess ever played